Remain standing as we read again from, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll, we'll just read one verse of scripture. Look at Genesis 2.18. Genesis 2.18. It says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That verse from the New Living Translation says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Lord, bless your word today in Jesus' name. You may be seated. So I've been teaching this series for those of us who are new here. And uh, I've been teaching this series for the last three, this is the fourth week now, called Love, Marriage, and Sex, okay? Ideally in that order, let me say it again, ideally in that order, Love, Marriage, and Sex. And so uh, I think the media department has a little bit of a synopsis of what perhaps what I, some points I covered last week. Go ahead and show that. God intended, talk to the married people, for your marriage to be pleasurable. So you should enjoy your marriage and not merely endure your marriage. You should enjoy your husband, not merely endure your husband. You should enjoy your wife, not merely endure your wife. You don't go into marriage with the idea of taking. You go into marriage, what do I have to give? Am I at a place in my life that I'm sufficient to give to a woman? Do I have what it takes to give to a man? I want a man who makes six figures. I need want a man to know how to dress. I need a man who, okay, are you the kind of woman that man would want? God intended y'all for wealth to be built, established, and perpetuated through families. Say it with me, say my family will build wealth, establish wealth, and perpetuate wealth. That's the will of God for your families. For you to build it, for you to establish it, and you to perpetuate it. God wants you to, to have a testimony that your children tell. Are y'all listening to me? Not that they're in the same situation. They come up, they get out because God used you and God used your marriage and God used your family to set a new income standard in your family. Amen. But before I go any further, I also want to recognize today we have uh, some Columbia High School officials uh, worshiping with us today. Mrs. Sean Washington, the principal of Columbia High. Where are you at? Y'all stand up. Precious Wims, assistant principal, and also Ron Webb and Alton Taylor. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We have partnered with Columbia High. Not only did they come, they came bearing gifts. Came Baron Gibson, thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. So we we talked about love, sex, and marriage. Last week we re, we went into more detail about why marriage. And let me remind you what the impetus of this is. The impetus of this was one of our single members of our church said to me, and he really kind of uh, it kind of sideswiped me. I didn't quite understand, but I meditated on and thought about it. And the Lord led me to do this. She said that doesn't think our church does enough, or I do enough to encourage marriage. And I didn't quite get that, but I said, okay, well, let me take four weeks and encourage it. <laughs> okay? Thought I didn't do enough. We talk about marriage. We didn't do, you know, uh, enough to encourage marriage. And so we've been spending the last three weeks talking about God's plan for marriage, God's plan for family, and God's plan for sex, which was to be within the confines of marriage, and why, okay? And so I'm, I'm kind of giving today a subtopic called good help, called good help, uh, because I've discovered years ago that help isn't help unless it's the help you need. Y'all ever, y'all ever have a, you ever have a baby, a little toddler, and he's trying to do something, and they, they trying to help you, but they spilling the stuff all over the place. They, they try, I, I help, and they just in the way. That's because even though they're trying to help, help isn't help unless it's the help you need. And Genesis 2:18, in the context of God putting together the first man and woman coming together, and he ordained for them to be together, one, and, and what we have now termed marriage. God said, it's not good 
that man should be all one. That word all one, if you look at it, it really comes from, it's a compound word from two words. All one. It's not good for man to be alone. It comes from compound all one. It's not good for him to be completely 100% self-deficient in himself. So God takes the female part out of him and he forms a woman. And so you need to understand, especially men, we are deficient by design. Not only we as men, but all of us are deficient by design. In other words, there's something you can't do without help. There's something that you need someone else for. God created us deficient by design. He says, so I'm going to make a help meet for him. Okay? I don't know how some kind of way the church has put that word help meet together as a noun, and it's not a noun. And every time I see it, I want to call up somebody and write them or tell them, stop saying that. It's not a help meet. Help meet is not a noun. The help is the noun. The meet is the adverb, okay, uh, to, to, to describe what kind of help. A help, that word meet means suitable for him. I'm going to give him help who is suitable for him. Help that is suitable for him, okay? Help me is not, oh, my wife, this is my help me. You ever hear people say, this is my help me? My help me. And they say it like, you know, you help, me meet the, help me meet the gas bill, help me meet the light bill, help me meet the mortgage. No, that, that's, get rid of that concept, okay? Help me, God said, I'm going to give him a help who is suitable for him. That tells me that Eve had all the qualities that Adam needed in a wife. Not merely that man needed in a woman, but that Adam specifically need. If, if I, I needed to do, fulfill my life assignment, I needed a particular kind of woman. And, and, it, and the woman I ended up marrying was different than anybody thought in a traditional sense. Okay, I've been preaching since I was a, since I was 12 years old. Start off in a traditional high Baptist church that we didn't sing, we didn't clap our hands, y'all. We didn't clap, our, our church was too sophisticated to clap the hands, okay? We clapped the hands one Sunday a, a, a month. That was when the gospel chorus sang. And that, was, and, they, and that was only a couple folks in the church. And then good old Miss Hughes over there, the one praiser in our church. One, we had one praiser, Miss Hughes. Now she drank on Saturday, but she praised on Sunday. And she would wait till it get quiet. When after the hymn would be finished, she would say, oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Now, I'm like, what are you, he did what? We just got finished singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And her response, oh, yes, he did. Okay. And so I came out of, and then, then I came over to my uncle's church and, and it was in uh, uh, Pen Pentecostal circles. And as I, as I came up in the church, uh, you know, we, uh, there's, there were three particular, um, uh, we all kind of were young people together. We all kind of knew each other. We all kind of went in the same circles. And, and you know, we, everybody kind of knew everybody who everybody went, went and dated. And here I come with this Catholic girl. Didn't even come, come from my city. I was the talk of the town. Me and, me and two other pastors. I was showing Pastor Marshall one of them the other day. One of them, he's now a church guy in Christ pastor. He talked about him because he married an apostolic girl. Okay. And then the other pastor who's now a bishop in the church down in Christ, he married a girl from the Baptist church. And I went way out. I didn't get apostolic, I didn't get, I got a Catholic, okay? I met, and so my wife was Catholic when I met her. And where God was taking me, if I had somebody who was steep in the tradition I came from, it would have been harder for me to get out. Because not only did I have to bring myself out, I have to try to bring her. And so my wife has always been a very logical person. You know, when you come along in those circles, I come, you did stuff because they said it. Okay, you just did what they said. If, if they said this was wrong, it was wrong. Women shouldn't wear pants. Why? It's an abomination. Okay? Um, well, you, women ain't supposed to wear makeup. Why? Because you're supposed to look ugly. <laughs> no, they, they didn't say that. that. It might as well have been that. <laughs> Okay? And we didn't question things. And so then I married, I, I, uh, my wife got saved, came from the Catholic church, and then she, she didn't, wasn't, in, he wasn't in this background. And she came along, and she started saying, well, why do they do such and such? Well, why does that, that doesn't make any sense. I'm like, you ain't supposed to say that. Just go along, cooperate. She said, I don't understand that. Well, why? Okay, you know, she was like, you know how the little uh, two-year-old, why? 
Why? She wanted to know why. And so as God, but God, and even though people did not understand the wife that God gave me, God gave me a wife who was meat for me. Suitable, watch it, not only for where I was, but for where I was going. I can stop right there because see, some of y'all, you you so caught up in where you are, you don't think about where you're going. I don't know one, because the scripture says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. He, when he's old, it didn't say anything about those in-between years. One of, our, one of our leaders who's in our school of ministry from, from our Florence location, he said he, said he was raised in the church. His, mother and fa- his mother's a pastor. His father stood in the AME church. He always loved the Lord. He said, but when I went to college, I took a break. How many of y'all took a break when you went to college? Yeah, we took a break. Y'all ain't taking no break, right? Because y'all serving Jesus. Er day. Okay. But some of us, he said, he said, when I went to college, he said, I took a break. But now he's, he, he's on God's path. Of life. He's pursuing ministry, okay? And so the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. And see, some of y'all in situations right now who are raised in the church, you're taking a break right now. But that ain't where you plan on staying. I don't know one person who's been raised in the Lord, raised in the things of God, who say, I'm planning on twerking all my life. I'm planning on taking shots and turning up all my life. Nobody plans that. You think this is just a season, but then you, you get connected to somebody in this season and you make a permanent decision in a temporary situation. And now you realize the person you're sleeping with or love is not the person who's going to make a good husband and not the person who's going to make a good father and not the person who's going to make a good grandfather and not the person who's going to make a good mother or grandmother. Because you made a permanent decision in a temporary situation. I had enough sense to know that semester or two that I took a break. I wasn't going to marry none of them. No, I'm, I'm very serious. I, I knew that. I, I knew that these, these, these girls who I was letting catch me. Because I wasn't on the prowl, but they was after brother. I'm very serious about that, especially, I don't know why, I played my junior year, and once I got these letters across my chest, the girls went crazy. I didn't understand it, because I was the same guy. I was, I'm like, what, what, what does this say? What does this mean, always? And, well, I mean, what, what does that mean? Because really, it, it, gave, it, it gave me access, they had access to me. <laughs> Okay, and so which, which is why sometimes I, I'm, I'm hesitant sometimes to tell some of you who want to pledge whether or not you see, you, everybody needs to see God for that, but you should not be pledging to get an identity. You should not be connected with some organization to get an identity. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone being Christ, he's a new creature, all things are, your identity, you already, if you're a Christian, you already have an identity. Your identity is in Jesus. Amen. And so, and so God gave me a help meet for me. And God said, it's not going to make him a helper who's just right for him. He's going to give him good help. And so I, I, I'm kind of going from where I left off last week. Then I want to go a little bit further. I'm not going to finish this. Okay. But uh, brothers, you can, you can get the wrong wife. Yeah, I know she's fine. Lips, hips, and dips, and all that fine. But, but you, you, can get the, you can get the wrong wife. Proverbs 21 and 9 says, when you get the wrong one, it's better to be in a corner on a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Y'all know the contentious woman. You see him on TV, the one who say, Byron, Byron. That's a contentious woman. I can't imagine lost the following night. Herb, herb, herb. And a lot, a lot of brothers going to tell you, man, man, you know these women crazy. These women, no, 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 no. You with a crazy one. They ain't all crazy. You're settling for a crazy one. You're settling for drama. All women aren't like that. You better keep looking. You better look beyond the weave. 
Did did, did y'all see that? Marvin Sapp was baptizing. He he was baptizing. The girl came to be baptized. And before she went down, she took her two buns off. He fell out laughing. Wow, it's supposed to be a serious moment. Brothers, sometimes the ones who got the expensive ones, you don't know. You might have to just accidentally tug or something. See, some women, oh, you better not touch my hair. That verse in the Living Translation says, better live alone in a corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. Women, you need to understand, women, catch this, women set the atmosphere in a home. You, you got a contentious woman, you have a contentious home. You have, a, you have a strifeful woman, you have a strifeful home. And we know this, that's, that's why the sense, somebody got the saying, okay, and it, it's really, it goes deeper than, than what we say, and that is what, if mom ain't happy, what? Ain't nobody happy, because they set an atmosphere in the home. That verse of message translation says, better to live in a, in a tumble down shack than share a mansion with a nagging spouse. Now, let me go a little deeper on the other point I made last week about women. You can, get with a, you can get with a man who's a fool. Let me tell you the first sign of a fool. Nobody can tell me anything. That's the first signs of a fool right there. You may think that's smart, but that's the first signs of a fool. Nobody can tell me anything. The Bible says a fool is said in his heart that there is no God. The Bible said don't even try to give an instruction to a fool because he's not going to listen. So a fool, nobody can tell you anything. And the Bible tells us in the scriptures in 1 Samuel 25 and 25 about this man named Nabal. Nabal didn't understand how to respect authority. Mm. Nabal didn't understand how to respect authority. And David comes along as the heir apparent to the kingdom and he needs some rations for he and his men. And he comes, he sends a word to Nabal, can you help me and my men out while they are fleeing from Saul? And, and, uh, and Nabal says, who, 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 who's this David? I ain't giving him nothing. It's a whole bunch of folks out here in the streets, so they ain't giving them nothing. And, Dave, and, and, and they send back words. David said, listen, he said, he don't care nothing about you, about you being a king, a parent, none of this stuff. He said, he ain't giving you nothing. David said, oh, I'm going to kill him and everything and everybody connected to him. And the woman had to run out, Abigail, and intercede, intercede and make amends and bring him rations and say, and she says in 1 Samuel 25 and 25, New Living Translation, he said, I know Nabal is wicked and, and an ill-tempered man. He's wicked and he's an in, ill-tempered man. The King James says he's an SOB, son of Belial. What did you think I, that meant? <laughs> He's a son of Belial. No one can tell him anything. He said, she said, please don't pay any attention to him. He's a fool, just as his name suggests. The word Nabal meant fool. He said, He's a fool, just like his name says. But I never even saw the young man you sent. He's, and so, so watch this. If a woman marries a fool, you always got to be intervening and handling something the man should handle. Oh, y'all are like me now. So one of the first signs of a fool is you can't tell him anything. Now let me go a little deeper with this. I find it so amazing that in the scriptures, Moses, Moses, he has encounters with God no one else has. He's the one God appears to in a burning bush that did not consume, was not consumed. God speaks to him out of a, out of a burning bush in the, in the voice of Charlton Heston. Some, some <laughs> Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Moses, take off thy shoes for the ground on which thy standeth is holy ground. And God appears to him, tells him, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. He uses his staff, and the, and the, and the staff is turned to a snake, and then it turns back. He uses his staff, and water comes out of a rock. He uses his staff, and the, and the waters part in the Red Sea, and they go, go across in dry land. And then when Moses' sister... And brother started murmuring against him because he married an Ethiopian woman. He studied scripture. He married a black woman, and they didn't like it. 
they started murmuring against Moses, and I heard somebody else teach this this week, I was, and this is good, especially for Black History Month. He said, oh, you're the man, and so, and so they were murmuring against Moses because he married a black woman. So God says to, God says to Miriam, he said, oh, oh, you like white, huh? I'm gonna make you white, and gave her leprosy. That's a whole nother way to look at that thing. She turned white with leprosy. And then God says to, to, to Miriam and to Aaron, he said, now you need to be careful about putting your, putting your mouth on Moses. He said, with everybody else, I'll talk to you about dreams and visions. He said, Moses, not like it. He said, I talk to Moses face to face. You keep your mouth off Moses. And God defends Moses. Nobody has ever done. Moses got the Ten Commandments upon which all the rest of the scriptures refer to. And yet, Moses, when it comes to leading people and administrating over these estimated three million people in the wilderness, when people have issues, he's standing there in front of them all day in the desert and they're lined up for him to adjudicate their cases. And he took an older man, his father-in-law, who comes and says to him, Moses, the thing that you're doing is not good. He said, you need to separate these crowds and, 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 and put a point leader from which, from which we get uh, uh, bureau, bureaucratic theory in, when, when you study leadership about this is the first bureaucracy. He said, put men over hundreds, over fifties, over tens. Let them handle the smaller matter. You handle the larger matter. Now, as much as Moses was a wise man, he needed an older man to tell him how to handle this situation. And yet there are people who say, nobody can tell me anything. Men, somebody needs to be able to tell you something. Let me go deeper. Because I've discovered that many times the men who are so defensive about no man can tell me anything are ones who don't have fathers. Or didn't have a father in your life. Because you were not used to a man telling you what to do. If you grow with a father, the first voice you hear is a man telling you what to do. Boy, come over here. Put that down. You're not going. So you, 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 you get used to the voice of, a, of authority speaking to you. But if you grow up without a man of authority in your life, you grow up and oh, who, who the main ones who are we talking about? Man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. I'm, I'm, I'm a man. You know, nobody tell me nothing. I do wrong. Men who didn't have fathers. I can show you in the scripture, the Bible tells about the guy named Jephthah. Jephthah was rejected in his household. He was separated. Even though he went to live with his father, his brothers didn't like him. So Jephthah ended up being a gang leader. It's in Judges around the seventh chapter. And so you need a voice of authority. Ladies, I'm talking to the single ladies now. When you go to get with a man, find out who's a voice of authority in his life. Because he may be going along with what you say now. But once he got you, he got you. He ain't going to listen to nobody. You, you go talk about, let's talk to the pastor. I don't talk to no pastor. Uh, I'm coming right down. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to talk to no pastor. I do what I want to do. Well, let's get counsel. I don't need nobody to counsel me because you're a fool. Who doesn't realize that you need the wisdom of somebody else in areas of your life. <laughs> Deacon, uh, Deacon uh, Goodwin, where you at Deacon Goodwin? Is he here today? Deacon Goodwin is a, is a, is a brick mason. He's a, he's a foreman on his job. And he went to tell somebody working under him to, what to do. He said, you don't tell me what to do. He said, who you think you are? I'm the foreman. <laughs> Duh. Again, someone not understanding authority. So you think any voice of authority is too much. So ladies, be careful. A wrong woman tears down her own house. Proverbs 14.1, it says the wise woman builds her house. Amplify says on the foundation of godly principles and her household thrives, but the foolish one who lacks spiritual insight tears it down with her own hands by ignoring godly principles. And ladies, you got to be careful of listening to all your girlfriends who ain't never had a man. And they're going to tell you, how you what they wouldn't do if they were married to your husband. They're not married to your husband. You listen to your Aunt Lucy, who, who's 70, ain't never been married. Every man she ever had is a man she used to have. 
listen to me, and you're listening to people giving you wisdom, which is not wisdom at all. So make sure you're getting godly wisdom. Titus 2, and 2 3 through 5, it says that older women, you got any older women in here? Let's see who, let's see who women, if I got any women who will acknowledge that you're an older woman. Any older women, raise your hand. Okay, I thought y'all, all y'all were going to act like you're 25. <laughs> Titus 2, 3 through 5, it says the aged women, the older women, likewise, that they should be in behavior as becoming holiness. You should be an example to younger women. It said not false accusers, not, not given to much wine. I wish I could even take much out. <laughs> Teaching good things that they may teach the young women to be sober. That means, that's not talking about be, uh, not drinking. Sober here, it means to be clear thinking, to understand how your decision today is going to affect you tomorrow. I know you think everything is more important than your children, but you're going to regret that one day. And you need an older woman to tell you there's some opportunities you can't miss. I, I, I sat down with some, I was in a conference this week, sitting down with some younger pastors who was saying, I'm trying to balance my son being in sports with ministry. And I said, well, I said, I said we had to do the same thing. And uh, he said, I, I said, but you, I said, you need to understand this. There's some things that's going to come back around, some things that's not going to come back around. I know a great pastor who I heard him say, you know, he was never home when his kids were being raised because he was out preaching the world and saving the world. He said, but the Lord told him he's going to give him those years back. I said, that's a lie. He's going to give you future years. You don't get those years back. There's a man in our church, I can say this because he's not here anymore. But I'm, there was a man, we were having a man-to-man -man years ago talking about being raised. And, and at the time, the man's like 45. It was just all men there. And he started having a breakdown. He said, I played baseball. My father never, he never came to one of my, one, to one of my games. Not one. This man's 45. You don't get it back. There's some things you don't get back. You got to understand that. And, you, and, and some of us, some of us, we got to admit, we're going to be better grandfathers than we were fathers. We're going to be better grandmothers than we were mothers. And so you have to, it says, teach them to be sober, clear thinking, connect the dots. You're chasing the wind, and is, which is like chasing a cloud. I, remember, I was saying yesterday when I was school ministry, the first time I was in the plane, and I saw we were headed towards the clouds, I held on. I said, oh, God. We going in the cloud. When we went in the cloud, I thought, I, I thought the plane was just going to start rattling. Nothing happened when we went in the cloud. Know why? Because the cloud is just full of air. And some of y'all that are chasing stuff, it's just a cloud. You think you're going to be able to grab it? It's just a handful of air. There's nothing there. You got to get your priorities right with your family. You got to get your priorities right with your wife, with your husband, with your children. You don't get it back. You get additional years. Teach them to be discreet, chase, keepers at home. Nobody want to keep the home today. Somebody got to keep the home. I said, somebody, it, 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 if we walk in and it's closed all over the place, we don't care whose fault it is. Somebody got to clean it up. Well, my wife, well, my husband. My, my, my former pastor told me in Oklahoma years ago, I was complaining. We had been married. We weren't even married 10 years. We're married 39 now. We, and my former pastor, and I was complaining about Marcia. I said, she, she ain't doing this, and I want her to do this. He said, well, you do it. I said, huh? That wasn't the answer I wanted. I said, she's not doing it. He, he said, you're the head of your house, aren't you? Uh, I think. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to be right now. He said, you're the head of your house. Anything you want done in your house, you do it. Set the example of what needs to be done. I, 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 I tell men that today, and, and y'all look at me like, that's another gospel. <laughs> if you can't do it and you can pay for it, get somebody. But some, the house needs to be clean, y'all. The clothes got to be picked up, y'all. Somebody got to teach somebody to keep it home. Traditionally, it was women. Traditionally. But we don't have traditional families right now. Because a lot of the women are working as hard, if not harder, than men. 
So the idea, it got to be done. You can't have a non-traditional family and expect your wives to have traditional roles, men. Well, I need, I, you know, when I come home, when I come home, I want food, food on the table. She got in the house five minutes before you. That's unrealistic. So if y'all both working, bringing all this money in, stop paying for stuff. You can pay for somebody to wash your clothes. You can pay for somebody to clean the house if, if you have the money. I'm not saying do that if you don't have the money, but this stuff got to be done. It ain't like man, it, it, it's not like the man don't mind if he, don't, if, if he have dirty drawers. He does mind, he may not say anything. Brothers, do you mind? I'll, 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 I'll go, sometime I'm in, I'm in, I'll go look at my drawer, I'm looking class. So, oh Lord. All, all of a sudden, Pastor wants to come with a handful of clothes. Here they are right here, honey, calm down, calm down. You got some clean drawers right here. Chill out, Hakuna Matata. A godly spouse brings favor in your life. Favors when God raises up what? Somebody, somewhere, use their power, their ability, their influence to help you. Brothers, when you marry the right woman, when you have good help, things get better in your life. Well, ever since I married this woman, myself ain't, well, you married the wrong one. I don't have nothing since I married her. You married the wrong one. The right wife brings favor in your life. Proverbs 18, 22. Whosoever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. New Living Translation said the man who finds a wife finds a treasure and he receives favor from the Lord. So there are things that happen in my life only because I married Marcia. And I would be, I, I would be a fool to think it would happen otherwise. You know, I, I, uh, I, I sent her, I, I don't, she, she didn't say anything about it. I sent her the other day, I happened to come across some pictures. Did you see the picture I sent you? I sent her a picture of the dilapidated house he used to live in. <laughs> I, 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 sent her, I sent her a picture of, of this house where, where, where she was, it, it didn't quite look that bad when, when uh, she was living there, but I sent her a picture of that, that house and, uh, and some, sometime I, I joked with her, I said, you know, I've taken you around the world. You know, you know I, you, you, I've been able, I, you have traveled around the world. And she said, yes, she said, I got you out the storefront church. So this is a partnership. <laughs> this is reciprocity. You take me around the world, I help you have a nice church. <laughs> Every relationship, y'all, let me stop parking there for a moment. Every relationship should be a relationship of reciprocity. I don't mean you use each other, but we both should be getting something out of this relationship. And I'm not just talking about sex. Because that can dry up. Or you can dry up. Or you can get tired. Don't, I, got, I, I got new people here. I can't go deep into this. But it has, has to be more than that. What are we, what, how, how are we meeting each other's needs? I heard something recently, you know, and, and, and it made so, made so much sense. When people say, I'm not happy in my marriage, this is the interpretation. I have needs that are not being met. When anyone says I'm unhappy in my marriage, that means there are needs that are not being met. So somebody needs to have a discussion, well, what needs are not being met that I need to meet for you? Or how can we better meet each other's needs? Because that's all happiness is. Happiness is relative, right? Some, some people like chocolate cake, some people like vanilla cake. It, it, or some, people, some people pig feet make them happy, and me, uh, filet mignon make me happy. It's all relative. So you need to find out how you meet each other's needs to add to each other's happiness. A godly spouse brings comfort in your life. Everybody say comfort. Comfort means it makes things comfortable. Is your life more, a spouse should make your life more comfortable. Genesis 24, 67. Now Isaac didn't choose his wife, by the way. Abraham sends his servant, uh, Eliezer, to go find him a wife. And he prays, God, lead me to the right woman for my master's son. 
And he brings back Rebekah. And I, Genesis 24, 67 says, and Isaac brought back, brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent and she became his wife. Here's what I want you to see. He loved her deeply and she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. She was, she was of comfort in, in, a, in, a, in a spousal relationship. You also bring comfort to each other, not stress to each other. Y'all quiet up in this church up in here. I'm, I'm going to pray for all the couples when I'm done. Bless the Lord. She brought him comfort. A godly spouse can pray for you and pray with you. Now, if you really understood that, you would never want to be yoked up with an unbeliever. Be, un, be not unequally yoked with, a, with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Why? Because you can, if you don't believe what I believe, you ain't going to pray what I pray. And you're not going to pray how I pray. Genesis 25, 21, I've pointed this out to men in the past. A lot of us, we're very familiar with women praying, praying women. But look at Genesis 25, 21. It says, Isaac, when, when Rebecca could not have children, said Isaac pleaded with the Lord, on New Living Translation, he pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. And the Lord answered who? Isaac's prayer. And Rebecca became pregnant with twins because the man prayed. Come on, we need some men who can hook a Messiah. We need some men who can get a prayer through. We need some men who call on the name of the Lord. We need some men who get up in the middle of the night. We need some men who intercede on behalf of your wives and your children and your sons and your daughters and your parents. We need men to intercede. God didn't open up her womb because she prayed. He opened up her womb because he prayed. So a godly spouse brings more. Everybody say more. Brings more, more into your life. So let me, let's talk a little bit more about this good help. Several things I want to point out. Good help gives you, number one, a great inheritance. Everybody say greater inheritance. <laughs> so the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 16 and 17, um, it says we're the children of God, and because we're children of God, and we're not all children of God because we're born as humans. We're children of God because as many as be believed upon him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So we're all, we're all children of God in a creative sense. We're not all children of God in a spiritual family sense until you get saved. You're with me here. So he's talking about to save children of God. Beloved, we are the, be a, we are the children of God, verse 17. And if we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I want you to catch that. Every believer who received Jesus is an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. That means when God raised Jesus up, he raised me up. That means when God made Jesus rich, he made me rich. That, when, that means when God gave Jesus power, he gave us a power. That means when Jesus was raised up to sit in heavenly places, I've been raised up with him to sit in heavenly places. Somebody say, I'm a joint heir with Christ. Now, we all have that right individually. As individuals, we are heirs of God, okay? As individuals. Um, Charles, uh, uh, Harry, and what's the other one? William. 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 They, they are heirs, okay? Um, they, they, they have expression that Harry wrote about in his book called The Heir and the Spare. The heir is the main one who's going to send to the throne. The spare is something happens to that one. Okay, but they are heirs to the Windsor dynasty. They are heirs, okay? And, and so about each of us individually are heirs of God. But now watch this. It's very important if you want to go to another level, you marry another heir. Y'all didn't catch that. If you want to go to another level and walk in the fullness of your inheritance, you need to marry another heir. Not somebody who's just going to be taken from you, but somebody bringing something to this table. And right now, I ain't talking about financially. <laughs> Can you pray with a brother? Can you encourage a sister? Can you uphold me when I'm too weak to uphold myself? Can you pick me up when I can't pick up myself? And I know you fall in love, and I know people are fine, 
and I know they look good, and I know your hormones get to going, but y'all, you got to think. I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a mission to get y'all to think. I'm seeing too many jacked up marriages. You need to think. You got to think long, you got to think wide. You got to think long, you got to think wide. Long means down the road. Wide means what else is this going to affect? You got to think long and think wide. Come on, say, Lord, help me to think long and think wide. So we're all heirs of God, but now look at 1 Peter 3 and 7. Sitting down like husbands, he's talking to believers, dwell with them, your wives, according to knowledge, and give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Okay? Doesn't mean weaker, weaker, uh, 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 it doesn't mean that you're weaker mentally and all that, but just biologically, okay, uh, your, your, your bodies are weaker, but not only that, it means you're more fragile, like a treasure. He said, give honor to the weaker vessel as, here we go, being heirs together. That's what I want you to see. You already are heir. Are y'all with me here? When you got saved, you became an heir of God. When you marry another heir, now y'all heirs together. Y'all are catching this here. That's why you got to be careful who you marry. Because you ought to be adding something to this inheritance. Not taking something away. So now it says, now, now when two believers get married, we're already heirs. Now we're heirs together of the grace of life. So your prayers aren't, aren't hindered. Then we ought to be able to accomplish more together, produce more together, dominate more together than we ever could alone when you marry the right one and you got good help. So secondly, you have greater reward. Everybody say greater rewards. Greater reward means that you have greater accomplishments. Every Christian couple should be a power couple. I said every Christian couple should be a power couple. I got power, you got power. We like power rangers. We get more power together. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 4 and 9 says what? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Okay? Uh, the New Living Translation of that verse says two are better off than one. If you marry the right one, to a better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Husbands, wives, don't compete in your own house. Don't compete. Don't try to compete with degrees. Don't try to compete with how much money you're making. Just bring it all together. You should not be in a competition in your own house. You're trying to prove that you are as smart as your wife or got more than your wife or, or in the wife with the husband. You should not be, this is not a competition. This is, is, this is supposed to be an enhancement. Two better than one, they have good reward. They're better off than one. Now, there was a study published by Brookings. It was done by Reeves and Krauss in 2017. Okay, no plagiarism here. I'm giving credit. And they found that married couples, y'all, have even higher incomes than shacking couples. Some of y'all say it's the same thing. And we just, no, 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 no. Okay. This is, this, this is not a biblical study. It's not a Christian study. It's an economic study. Found that married couples have even higher income than shacking cohabiting couples. Because one advantage of marriage is that two in incomes can be pooled. Yet, cohabiting couples have less income to pool. The earning gap between fathers is different in different family types stands out particularly strong. While married fathers earn an average of 55,000 a year, men living with the mother of their child even, or children earn just 29,000 a year. In fact, married fathers earn more on their own than the average cohabitating couple with a joint biological child earns between both parents. Well, why is that? Why is that? Remember, one scripture we looked at, the Bible said marriage is honorable. Did he not? And so I want you to catch this. There is an inherent blessing in marriage that you don't get from shacking. Y'all mad at me. Don't, just don't walk out right now. I won't know it's you. There's an inherent blessing that comes with being married that you don't get by shacking. Some of y'all trying to be super spiritual. Well, we ain't going to do nothing. 
We, we, just, we just gonna sit here and we just gonna lay here and spoon. Y'all know what I say about spooning? You keep spooning, somebody gonna want a fork. I said F O R K. All this spooning. Somebody gonna want a fork. There's a blessing on marriage that's not on cohabitating. There's a blessing on marriage that's not on shacking. The Bible said, God bless them. And what does the blessing do? Come on, y'all, y'all, are y'all with me here today? What does the blessing do? We know what the blessing does based upon Proverbs 10:22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. Put that scripture in Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich. It enriches your life. And he adds no sorrow with it. So there's a blessing that comes on a man and a woman together when they are in God-ordained matrimony. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, it said God created male and female and God blessed them. And the God bless who? God bless them. God bless who? God bless them. So there's a blessing that comes on them that just don't come on him. There's a blessing that comes on them that just don't come on her. God bless them. And he said to them, be fruitful. He said to them, multiply. He said to them, replenish the earth. He said to them, subdue the earth. He said to them, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moved on the earth. So there's a blessing that God has ordained when two God-fearing people come together as heirs of God that now we have a greater inheritance than we would individually. So the devil knows that too. So he tries to cause all kind of drama, cause people not operating wisdom, Carol's caused you to fall out over dumb stuff. You know, the, the longer you've been married, and we see younger people and the stuff that they be separating over, be like, like, please, y'all ain't even been through nothing. Just keep on, my, my uncle Bishop Bailey says, keep on living. Keep on living. You know, uh, I, I, I just, I'm tired of drawers being left on the side. I'm just, I just can't take this draw. You're gonna be glad you got a man that got some drawers. I'm sorry, underwear. <laughs> Some of the stuff you're complaining about and fussing about, you're going to have to learn to forbear. One of the th things that Christians do is forbear. You know what that word bear? I, we don't like that word. Forbearance means put up with. I know y'all love me, but y'all put up with me saying draws in church. I just wish he wouldn't say that. He just doesn't go through me. It would be better if he says underwear, but you forbear me. <laughs> forbear means when things don't go along to your preference. And so you need to know what are things that are preferences and what are things that are convictions. First of all, if, you, if you're with some, you should not have married somebody who's doing anything that goes against your convictions. Everything else is preference. Are y'all listening to me? So y'all, so the devil caused all kinds of division strife and divorce cuts off and short circuits the blessing. Let's talk about it a moment. Which is why just about everyone who gets divorced ends up talking about recovering from a divorce. Am I right? Am I right about it? I'm sorry, y'all, that just came out. <laughs> when, when people get divorced, they talk about recovering because we got to regroup. We got to reassemble. We got to refocus. Divorce cuts off and short circuits the blessing. Malachi 2, 14 through 16. I know y'all don't hear this in the, in the scriptures. I mean, in church, but I got to show you what the word says. Malachi 2, 14 through 16, and let me say this here, this is not to condemn anybody who's divorced, okay, making my feel bad. This is just for me to help the rest of y'all. Let's, let's stay together. 
Come on, help me. Loving you where the, where the, come on. That's the goal. So it's not, it's not trying to make anybody feel bad, okay? Malachi 2, 14 through 16, New King James says, yet, yet you say, for what reason? Why did God put you together? He says, he said, well, God said, I got some issues with you. Well, what's the problem, Lord? He said, I've been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. This is what I meant to say last week. So people, are, people automatically justify divorce because they say we, we were young when we got married. How many here? I can't tell you how many times I sat down with somebody get married the second or third time and I asked them about the first marriage. They always say we were young. And I want to say, and we were young too. Okay? So if you're too young to get married, don't get married. So listen, listen to that, first of all. Okay? But just because you're young, it doesn't mean your marriage can't work. You might need more help. He said, because the Lord's been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Now he's talking about divorce. And he's putting it on the man because in the scripture, a woman couldn't get divorced. It was on the man. But now, women just walking away. I mean, literally come home saying, you know what? I want to do this no more. No, I'm not saying that being funny. That's what's going on now. I've seen it happen too many times. No, it's not necessarily drama. Not falling out, not a fight. Ain't nobody beating or cheating. I got that mocking tune day. If you ain't beating or cheating, we can make it work. Nobody beating or cheating. Just somebody come up, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. You know why? Because you're looking at Instagram. And look like all your single friends are having, having fun over in DR while they're getting their Brazilian butt lift. And you look at you, you're comparing your life to somebody that you don't know the details of. You don't know the intricacies of. And so he said, you dealt treachery. He said, yet, God said, now, I know you're divorced. He said, but she's your companion. She's the wife of your covenant. You made a covenant. You made a vow before God, before these witnesses, before the man or woman of God. We all heard you. And you, you shouldn't just be walking away because you don't feel the same way you felt when you said it. That's why I told you, I, I let folk give these sentiments. Y'all can, can give your sentiments, but we're going to have some vows up in this piece. Sentiments, you know, ever since I saw you, the sun just rests on your eyes and it beams through your heart. And from the day that we saw each other, I knew that our hearts would be mended together. And I can't sleep at night without dreaming about you. That's wonderful. For better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, when you don't feel that no way, way no more, and when it look like the sun ain't shining. He says, she's wife of your covenant. And why do you make you one? Have the remnant spirit. He said, why one? And, and this is a whole nother message I can't get to today. He said, because I want godly offspring. I want you to raise up children together, ideally in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I want you all to produce something together and that you both are inputting into, that you're both imparting to. I want you to create something that you could not create apart. I want godly offspring. He says, so take heed to your spirit. He said, I know you're mad. Get yourself together. I know you're disappointed. Get yourself together. I know you're aggravated. Get yourself together. I know you're hurt right now. Get yourself together. Take heed to your spirit. Let none of you deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Verse 16, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. He does not say he hates divorced people. He says, I hate the byproducts of divorce. I hate what divorce does to families. Are y'all with me here? He says, I hate divorced people. I hate the outcome, the casualties of divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. He says, it says it again. He said, I know you're mad. Take heed to your spirit. Get yourself together. And let none of you that you deal not treacherously with the wife of your youth. So again, so divorce, after divorce, people talk about recovering from, from divorce. So I say, y'all, live on one income and live better with two. I don't care if it's 75, 25. That equals 100. If it's 125, that's 125.
I'm going to buy, probably any day now, I'm going to close on another investment property. I have several investment properties. My wife is on all investment properties. My wife is on, all, is on my home. My wife don't pay a mortgage. She don't pay one mortgage. We qualify together. You didn't catch that. We qualify together. I pay, but, she, but I qualify for more with what she brings to the table. Two are better than one. Are y'all with me here? So live off one, live better with two. Produce by yourself, single people, but produce more with the spouse. Fourth thing you have is greater dominion. Everybody say greater dominion. Greater dominion. So God says, be fruitful, be multiply, have dominion. So you can dominate by yourself, but you gain more dominion with, your, with, a, with a godly spouse. Genesis 126, let them have dominion. Let who have dominion? Let them have dominion. But as I get ready to close this, I want you to say, there's a process to dominion. Say that with me. Say there's a process to dominion. So you don't, you don't start off dominating. Someone doesn't win one race and you say, you know, they're dominating. A boxer doesn't have one match that he wins and they say, you know, he's dominating in boxing. Are y'all with me here? Dominating come through a series of events. Dominating come through a series of wins. And sometimes there's wins and losses and wins and losses and losses, 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 and a win. And losses, 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 and a win. And you don't call that person dominating. But when they keep going and they win and they win and they win over and over and over, you say now they're dominating. Are y'all with me? When we think about people who dominate, we think of people, people like, I'm, I'm a tennis fan. I've gone all around the world to watch tennis, okay? Uh, we think of Serena Williams. Now, see, Serena Williams dominated. When, when I used to go to the, to the New York, uh, to the U.S. Open in New York, I deliberately would try to get tickets to the, to the quarterfinals, to the semifinals, and I don't think I've ever been to a final. That, that, that was a whole nother deal. And usually on Sundays anyway, okay? But, but I, would, I would go because I knew Serena going to be there. Because she dominates. You don't start off dominating. You, start, you dominate out over time. The Bible said, let them have dominion. You got to hang in there if you're going to dominate in your marriage. You have to hang in there if you're going to dominate in your family. Dominion don't start at one time. It, dominion goes through a series of events. There's a process to, to dominion. In Genesis 27 and 40, you know, we read about, remember Jacob and Esau. So Jacob steals his brother's birthright, okay? He, his, his brother's blessing. Steals his brother's blessing. And by, 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 by perpetrating a fraud and, and making his father think it's him, his father speaks the blessing over Esau, uh, over Jacob that was supposed to go to Esau, the older one. And then, then he runs away and Esau comes and says, don't you have another blessing for me? He said, I don't have any more blessing to give you. But then he says this to him. He said, yeah, he's he going to rule over you, but this is so important. Genesis 27, 40, he said, but by thy sword thou shalt live. And you're going to serve your brother temporarily and it shall come to pass. Everybody say it's going to come to pass. It shall come to pass that thou shalt have the dominion. Marriage, listen, some of you, you're going through in your marriage right now, but I'm prophesying over you. If you hang in there, you're going to have the dominion. I'm, I know your children are taking you through right now, but I'm telling you, if you stay in there and keep praying for them and keep laying your hands on them and keep bringing them to church and keep, keep teaching the word of God, you shall have dominion. It shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that you're going to break his yoke from off thy neck. Come on, it's Black History Month here. When, when we look over black history and we look at all the black people, African Americans who have dominated, they didn't start off dominating. There was a yoke on our neck. Come on, we were, we were the last hired and the first fired and, and, and we had to start at the back and we couldn't come into the room but somebody kept on going. Somebody kept on going and said, I shall have the dominion. And, and I, can't get, I can't afford to just get caught up in anger and hate. I got to keep on working. I got to keep on pushing. I got to keep educating myself. I got to keep applying myself. I shall have the dominion. And I'm prophesying over you. God wants you and your family to have dominion. But you're going to have to fight to have dominion. You're going to have to declare to have dominion. You have to push through to have dominion. Somebody shout, I will have dominion. 
He said, eventually you shall have the dominion and you're going to break that yoke from off your neck. Break that yoke of poverty off your family. Break that yoke of dysfunction off of your marriage. But you don't have to fight. You, you have to fight to have dominion. You have to endure to have dominion. And you got to kill something to have dominion. Final thing, greater wealth. Everybody say greater wealth. Greater wealth. You have greater wealth through godly families. Esau 33 and 9, after he got the dominion, his brother's running from him. It's about 15 years later. And they said, man, we were over there across the, across the way, and your brother's coming. And Jacob said, oh, my goodness. He's going to kill me. He said the last thing he do, he's going to kill me. And he finally, and J J after 15 years, Jacob and Esau come back together, and, Joseph, and Jacob was trying to appease him. He, he sent all the kids he didn't want and sent, sent them up front. He sent the wives he didn't really want. He sent them up front, okay? And he said, you can have all that trying to appease him. And Esau said, Genesis 33 and 9, he said, you can have that. I have enough, my brother. Somebody say, somebody say I have enough, my brother. <laughs> I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. I'm no longer competing against you. I have enough. I'm no longer jealous of you. I have enough. I don't compare myself to you. I have enough. The white man ain't keeping me down. I have enough. Come on, the princess can't hold me back. I have enough. Are y'all listening to me? Wealth is gained and maintained, as I close this, is gained and maintained through intact families. In other words, the longer families stay together and works together and grows together, the more dominion you should have. Psalms 112, 1 through 3, he says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. His descendants are going to be mighty on the earth. The generation the upright will be blessed. Psalm 112 and 3 says, Wealth and riches will be in his house. Future tense. It may not start there. Uh, I'm, come on, say this. Say, Wealth and riches will be in my house and in my family because we're going to dominate together. Wealth and riches will be in his house and righteous doors forever. Somebody say, we're working on something. I, I, I know you're going through and the devil trying to cause all division and strife in your family, but you got to recognize we're working on something. Glory to God. My wife and I, we, we've been through some rough times and, 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 hard, and hard times, but we always had enough sense to know we're working on something. We're working on something. We know that there's something that God wants us to produce together that the devil will succeed in destroying if he breaks us up. Devil, you are a liar. We're working on something. In the U.S. and in most industrialized countries, y'all, wealth begins and increases with home ownership. And unfortunately, black Americans have the lowest rate of home ownership in the United States. And despite the efforts of this uh, most recent administration, white Americans enjoy the highest ownership rate of 74%. Asians, 59%. Indians and, and natives, uh, uh, they, they come in number three at 55%. And yet Hispanics and black Americans have the lowest rates of 48 and 44%. And according to the National Association of Realtors, in, 20, in, 19, in 2020, 79% of homeowners were married. 20, in 2022, they reported 60% of the recent home buyers are married. Wealth increases through marriage. And I want everybody connected to me to believe God to own a home. Amen. Come on, all the renters say, I will own, I will own. Come on, say, I will own. Everybody paying, paying a mortgage, say, I will own outright. I will own outright. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 8 and 12, he's, God says, you're going to build beautiful houses and you're going to dwell in them. God intended y'all for wealth to be perpetuated through your families. And so Abraham, the Bible says in Genesis 25, 5, and 6, he gave all he had to Isaac. He left him something. Verse he gave gifts to the rest of his sons. In Genesis 26, 18, Isaac dug again the wells that his father dug. He didn't have to start from scratch. His father had already dug some wells for him. Proverbs 19 and 14, it tells us that fathers can give their sons inheritance of houses and wealth. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man does what? Leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Final scripture, 2 Corinthians 12, 14. I want you to think about this, parents, that this is bigger than you. 
when you're going through stuff in your marriage, when the devil's attacking your family, understand this is bigger than you. I mentioned, I mentioned, I don't know if you all caught this, I heard about their couples who even if they're getting divorced, they're coming up with strategies now to try to not disrupt the children's lives as much. So they're going through a divorce, but they're deciding they still stay in the same house. The children stay in the house, and the parents go in and out. They can't make it, but we're not going to disrupt. Now, that we know that ain't the best. I was listening to an interview yesterday with Jada Pickett on NPR. <laughs> and, 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 and she said that, she, and so the person asked her, oh, well, you and Will together? She said, we're together in a way that works for us. You know, a situation shit. Sometimes you got to think beyond you for your children's children. 2 Corinthians 12 and 14, the latter part says, watch this, children ought not lay up for the parents, but parents lay up for the children. It's God's desire for you to lay up something for your children. Leave something for your children. And not just be, Papa was a rolling stone, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Papa was a rolling stone. Y'all don't know Amazing Grace, but y'all be knowing these songs. <laughs> when he died, all he left us. And you, did, did, did y'all ever hear all the verses to that? Papa's supposed to be a preacher. That's in, the, that's in that song too. Papa's supposed to be a preacher. Come on, stand with me. Did y'all get anything out of this today? 